Hello, everyone. Hello, Yossi Fine. Thanks, Ruth, for helping me to interview the legend. And just before listening to you on Kushame, we're going to launch a little video and um, maybe you will explain us what it means and why, why it is naughty by nature. Okay, you see, fine, what is this? I heard you have a connection to this song. Yeah, unbelievable, by the way. But please tell us more. What is the connection? The connection is the bass, bass connection. Well, I, I played bass on that album. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, I lived in New York for 10 years just as a bass player alone. You know what I mean? I was just bass playing for a lot of different people. And uh, hip hop was a big part of, you know, of something that I love. And then I got a call to, to come to the studio to play for Naughty by Nature. And I ended up playing on that album. And little did I know that it's going to be like that big. But uh, it, it was definitely one of the most significant recording sessions. And not because it be turned out to be famous, not because of that. It was just um, the fact that there were this other kind of musicians that usually when you deal musicians and with another musician, you have a certain language that you understand. You say, uh, can you play up the scale, down the scale, or, you know, in the higher notes, lower notes, especially on bass. And with Naughty by Nature, it was completely different language. I had to like, we needed almost like a translation because they were like, could you play a little more up? So I'm going up on the guitar and they go, no, more up. So I'm going up here and they go like, no, no, we mean here up meaning the neck is more up you know <laughs> so it, it came down to even like that but the way they listen to the music and the way they reacted to like the most minute details of my bass playing the way they heard it it was unbelievable i never had any musician be so uh paying attention paying attention to detail of a like most simple baseline that you may, might imagine and know what they want. They really knew how they want it and they really were like listening to it and I had to be in the groove so precise. Nobody ever wanted it to be like so good like, like they did. So after playing with them, it changed my way of um, approaching music. I understood that it's like, it's, it's, it, it's got to be about the feel first doesn't have to be right or wrong. It has to feel good. I don't know if we would manage to stick to the 30 minutes of Kushame with you, but because the, you have a fascinating uh, uh, background. You, why did I say you're a legend? You're a real reference in bass, in bass guitar. Uh, if we open internet, we, we read that you have uh, collaborated with Lou Reed, with the Stanley Jordan, Jill Evans, uh, Ofra Hazard, David Bowie, wow. You Kenny Kirkland. Like, yeah, <laughs> you, yes. Gotta get the cats in. <laughs> this yeah. type of musicians, uh, uh, we'd love to, to see your history as well in the next book of Barack Weiss. One day he's going to hate me, just look, look at that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you went to New York and collaborated with all these people. You must have a tons of anecdotes and story. How do we become the man you are there? Uh, um, how, how, did I, how did it happen that I ended up being in so many days? Love of music. Love of music and open. I just love music and I don't necessarily stick to a style. So, um, you know, I ended up, first of all, playing when I got to New York funk jazz that was the, the main thing that that i got called for but at the same time i would go to hip-hop clubs and heavy metal clubs and i loved reggae so to me it's all music i don't see the difference i see it's all the same it's either i love it or i don't or i don't like it it either moves me or it doesn't and especially in jazz where you are kind of got to be open to all kinds of influences so you could 
incorporate it into your, you know, the evolution of, you know, keep making uh, the progression of jazz as it was. So, you know, it, it, but it just came natural to me to go to a record store. I would end up coming with many different things. I, I never stuck into one thing only. I just love different styles. And eventually, I think a lot of the musicians that you mentioned, they have a lot of things in common. Gil Evans, uh, which is the, the, I would say the extension of Miles Davis, you know, they were like best friends and they were also collaborating for like 30 years, 40 years. Uh, even though Gil did not get a lot of the recognition on credits, you know, on the albums, but he did work on so many albums all the way till the end with Miles. And he was so open-minded that he took somebody like me, 21 years old, uh, to be in his band. And I told him, yo, I don't read, I don't read music, you know, I don't read music. I, I mean, you're, you're, you have a big band. I don't read music. He was like, you, you mean like all that you play, you don't read? I go like, no. He goes like, no, don't worry. I saw you play. You can come in. And I would just play myself. I would play bass uh, in his orchestra, but it would be so open and we would go into music from Hendrix and then all of a sudden we do a reggae groove and then we do like real jazz thing and then it would always be like that and eventually when I got to David Bowie it's the same mentality it's like David but most of the musicians that play with David Bowie other than the guitar players are jazz musicians yeah. but they are not standard jazz musician and they are just very open-minded jazz musicians that could you know go into different many different territories and i realized that uh playing with david bowie is the same thing to play with gil evans or with my idol miles davis but i never played with miles but that was my that was the top of the mountain so by having david bowie and gil evans it's kind of like <laughs> you know, but they're all very open-minded and you could start the show one way and end the show a completely different style. And on the tour bus, we will all listen to the newest hip hop th thing that came out or, or to metal or to whatever that was around that anybody got, you know, turned on and you would constantly get more and more music. No, this is fascinating. You again, uh, you you then is a, you are a bias player. When we discovered you in 2016, thanks to Mr. Barack Weiss again. I'm sorry to mention him so many times, but he's uh, at the source of it. We discovered uh, Gilly Yellow the same year. We discovered Cote uh, to Africa. Ami Rosanes is with us, by the way. And then in the place called the Zone, we see Yosti Fine, and immediately we realized this guy, mm. this white Gnawa, is going to be loved in our region. He must come. Of course, we know you know our region very well, but this had nothing to do with bass guitar. What happened? What is this story about the music from the Blue Desert? How did it start? Well, it's, it's something that, you know, when I went to uh, America, right, and People came from New Orleans. They were very proud that they are from New Orleans. They said, I'm, play I'm from New Orleans. That's the way we play in New Orleans. Somebody else came from Chicago and was like, I, I'm from Chicago. I play from Chicago, you know, I play Chicago style. And I'm from this region, the Middle East. And Israel is a very, very tiny place, but Israel is the most diverse place. You have Moroccans, Ethiopians, uh, Yemenite, Europeans, you have people from all over the world. And I grew up with all those influences. Obviously, uh, in New York, I actually got exposed to Genawa music and I ended up producing and working with Hassan Hakmoun, uh, the Genawa, the Genawa musician, you know, he was a mm. great Genawa musician. And so I always felt so connected to that. I was like, hey, that's, that's something that I totally get it. I totally get it. It's like in my DNA. Now, the only thing I have to say when people say white, I am from a black 
background. My mother is black, uh, you know, from uh, Martinique, you know, from the Caribbean islands. However, the DNA that we carry inside is obviously from Africa, but when I heard Ganawa and music from Mali, it just like hit me like, oh, that's like so natural. That's the way I hear it. And, the, you know, so there was a lot to do with that, that it was very easy for me to pick it up because it was like, it's, it's inside, even though it's, it's the same slaves. The same slaves that came to Morocco from the Sahara Desert are the same slaves that later went to Brazil and to America. And it's the, they carried the music that's called the blues. Even the samba is it comes from the same people. Genawa and samba are very similar. Bahia, mm. you know. So you provoking us. You know, we have few Moroccans <laughs> here, uh, and they will probably take uh, the lead at the end of this uh, of this Hulud. session. <laughs> we have Khouloud, we have Nadia, we have Amin. They're all journalists, by the way. Be careful about what you're saying. But uh, oh. <laughs> to us and me so much because uh, we didn't expect you <laughs> there, you know. And, uh, and today I, I want to form the dream that one day we'll go from the Gnawa uh, region uh, up to Brazil via maybe Cape Verde or, or, or the Canary Islands. You oh, yeah. Brazil, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can, I, I'm, I'm available that day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can see already the camera, you know, filming all of this. So we'll need all your energies. That's def definitely. Um, you mentioned as well that you, uh, your relation to reggae and you spent some time in Jamaica. Would you elaborate yeah. a bit on this? Yeah, a long time. I had, uh, uh, you know, coming from the Caribbeans, uh, my family always, I grew up with a lot of reggae you know, since, you know, and uh, since long time ago. And um, the bass, the bass sound, and the way I produce music a lot of times is like, as if it's like, a, almost like a reggae producer or a reggae sound engineer. I love the sound of reggae. More than anything, I love the sound of reggae. It always had like a, a big sound. And uh, I ended up going to Jamaica many times and producing, uh, making an album in Jamaica under a different name. I called myself Eccentric Sound System back then, but I ended up producing a lot of different artists in Jamaica, but never did an ordinary reggae production. It was always mixed with African music inside and African musicians. And I, I think because I'm a mixed, my, my background is mixed, you know, I'm always mixing different styles of music. I, I don't play Genawa. I just play the Genawa influence, but I don't play Genawa because I'm not a Moroccan and I'm not a Genawa, but I so much love that music that I incorporate that. And from the, where I'm from, the region where I'm from has a lot of Dabke music, which is uh, Arabic, uh, Palestinian, uh, wedding stuff, Bedouin, you know, from the desert. And I found that it's almost the same thing. It's just in Morocco, they, they emphasize certain things and here they emphasize different things. And if you fuse the two, and that's what I do with, 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 the, with the Blue Desert, it's fusing all of those things together. You know, even um, uh, Ethiopian stuff. It's not it, um, the music that I would love to create doesn't belong necessarily to one place or to one tribe. It's a, it's a, it's always a mix of all those things together and everything that I grew up with. So, if I would go with a Genawa, I would I I made a tune that is a Genawa tune uh, called Hamadi, and I love this tune. And I made it into a different song, but the music stayed the same. But I was like, it's, if I'll keep it a regular Moroccan Genawa, I'm not never going to be, it's never going to be believable if I'll do it. But let me put some distortion and acid <laughs> on it, you know? So it's like a Genawa on steroids, on acid type of thing. In the end, it comes like that, you know? So it's a, it's a different type of thing, which I would love to see let's say if a Moroccan musician wanted to play Israeli music, 
I would love to see their take on it. I would not want to see them play it exactly like the Israelis would play it. The whole point is if you come from somewhere else, you have to bring your, you know, your twist, your flavor. So basically the music of your blood, the blood being mixed in all, all our cases. So yes. Let's have a let's have a, a flavor of what is Hamoudi, uh, Jose Luis, if you don't mind, to launch this uh, part of the video. Yeah, Hamouda. Hamouda. So yeah, it's yeah Hamouda. I call it yeah, but that's that's a uh, Hamadi, the Moroccan beginner um, thing. Sure. Yes. From Jazz FM, and not only from the IPO now. <laughs> the IPO. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Um, so, Yossi, um, before I ask you about your, your next projects, but tell us a bit about the um, the band in um, that you work with. I know Ben. Tell me a bit about Ben. And also, the last time when we saw you, you were in um, Gibraltar, and you had a, a different lineup. I see you brought on a female musician. So, I'd, yeah. I'd like to know a little bit more about her as well. Okay, so I'll start with her. Her name is Sharon Mansour, Shasha, and she's uh, also very mixed, uh, you know, parents from Iraq and Romania, you know. But the main thing, she's just a great keyboard player and she could play exactly the, the Arabic style really great and electronic style jazz and classical. She could play all those things really well and I really love that. It was, I saw that it would be very open with her. So that's Shasha. And uh, Ben, he's an exceptional drummer musician because he studied in Senegal to play Senegalese uh, sabar, which is uh, Senegalese drums. Uh, so he studied that for in Senegal. And when I met him, he played Sabar music. And I told him, hey, you know what? But we are from Israel. Why don't we play more, you know, the beats, more beats that come from our region, mm -hmm. but in, in, within the sound that you play with all the Senegalese drums. And slowly, you know, we created that style. And so we couldn't call it, you know, Sahara music, because we're not doing Sahara music. Or, so it, it ended up being, blue desert because it's 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 we made it up as if it was the desert that starts from here in israel all the way to the west coast of africa and it's all included because that's the way musicians used to travel back in the day and not only musicians the musicians that used to be with the merchants you know the mm -hmm. the whole silk road so you know, if you were a band, you were a touring band, <laughs> you would go, you know, in that route and play in tents. That's us. But, you know, nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different nowadays. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, that's the, that's the vibe of the music that we, yeah. you know, it has to connect to, so you, you kind of like know it without hearing it before, but it kind of resonates with you, especially if you're from around here. And with the sound, obviously, we are also jazz musicians, origin, you know, part of it, so we could improvise a lot. And we, we know we have the, the knowledge of how to create the whole set like that, you know, how mm -hmm. to write mm -hmm. the music like that. But yeah, so it's, it's a, new, a new old style of music, you know, a form of music that you know we wanted to explore and yeah. so you know the, the the combination of us brought it together 
Yeah, I think I think it's quite interesting that it, it's a, it is a new sound, and I, uh, th one of the elements of jazz is that you're always improvising and making your own sound, and it's it's actually quite exciting to hear something that is starting very organically and, and moving on to something else and resonating not just with you in the in that region but also in Europe it's I mean you've been very successful in in Europe yeah also in the US so, I mean we didn't play enough in the US but when we did people would go yeah. people were not because it's, it's fairly, you know it's it's grooving but the point was what if the slaves did not go to America then you know, there would be a different style of music. We wouldn't have jazz and blues. It, and that was kind of like what we are saying. If the, jazz, if the slaves did not go there, but went here, it would have been more like this in a way. You know yeah. what I mean? Because they would not be exposed to certain things, so. Right, right. Now, coming back to present day, we just found out a few weeks ago that you've been confirmed as the new artistic director of the world-renowned Red Sea Jazz Festival, and it takes place in Elat every year. Now, I understand that you're taking the, the festival in a different direction to what it's been in the past. So tell us a bit about this, because this is really quite exciting. Well, um, I, you know, first, let me go through the first festival, <laughs> because this year is the most... <laughs> insane year to program a festival it? you know uh but um yeah i mean i think that in a lot of not all but in a lot of jazz audiences jazz doesn't get to a lot of audiences because of the approach of a lot of the musicians or the people that decides who plays in the in the places and they are very purist about jazz and it has to be you know a certain way and and uh, acoustic and maybe up you know upright bass and all of those things and underneath all of that there's a new generation that doesn't doesn't go like that they don't vibe like that they are a new generation completely and they do play jazz but they, they grew up on everything else. They grew up on metal and on Genawa. New generation, they grew up on Genawa and metal and funk and hip hop, obviously. And I love, and I, I got exposed to so many of them and I want to include them, you know, way more. And I want to, if anything I studied from Gil Evans is always bring young musicians and let mm. them be and let them be and 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 they will bring something fresh into this thing and it's it's pointless to get stuck to the old way of the way things were because somebody played something in 1955 you don't have to play it all the 55 no. years later every fucking thing you know it's like why you know do your own thing and uh, you know and if you come from new orleans do your shit but if you come from in jerusalem do your shit you know what i mean and if you come from morocco do your thing and it will work out and that's what's that's the way we can you know evolve jazz also with the electronic music also with you know different things i mean i'm not the first uh jazz festival to do it by any means may, may, so far in the last <laughs> but but uh, but it's I, I think to keep the evolution of jazz right nowadays it doesn't have to stay American jazz American jazz is great and they are the, the birthplace of jazz but it doesn't have to stay there and if I saw a band coming from Greece I want them to play a Greek vibe of jazz and not an American jazz. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And ha with, with the audience who are used to a certain way of uh, having that festival presented to them, how are you going to create a buzz to, to actually get people to come in? I think it'll be much easier with the younger generation who, who, who really just love to dance and groove and feel the music. But some yeah. of the older generation might be a bit sort of, so how are you no, going to create there, there, that buzz? It's not that I alienate them at all. I mean, there's going to be a lot of real jazz uh, shows, and which I love, you know, the best. Um, the best, but at the same time, 
to open also other other uh, avenues. So everybody gets exposed to things that they don't know. The younger people would get exposed to the older guys, yeah. but the older guys, the main thing, they got to be exciting. They mm -hmm. just cannot be old for the sake of being old. You know what I mean? That happens in a lot of jazz festivals now that people take old musicians and they let them be old on stage and they go, we just give them a lot of respect because they're old. And I don't buy that. If you go on stage, you got to be exciting. You got to burn and you got to burn all the time until the last breath that you take. I saw many years ago, uh, Art Blakey, I was young. And I saw him, he was like, I think almost, and he was in his 70s. And he was burning. He was burning the drums. And I was like, wow. Gil Evans, when, when I played with him, he was 72. I was 21. And, and that's the way, so it's always got to be exciting. And uh, I think that that's the main thing. That young people can love jazz if jazz will be exciting for them. It's just not exciting most of the time. It's just heady. It's not exciting. So I hope that the excitement thing is going to come more about. So some might consider you now as an, an elder statesman of the, the Israeli music scene in, in, in Israel. Is, is that quite a, quite a, I wouldn't say a burden, but is that quite a responsibility on your shoulders? No. Because <laughs> I don't in see months. myself as, as I, I'm still, look, I'm still inside. I'm a kid, I, it, completely. I get, I, I get, uh, I, I listen to music as uh, the 16-year-old in me always listen to music and judge music within the same way. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is not so good. Oh, this is boring. I mean, I'm, I'm still like that. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm that way. And, uh, and so I know people that have white hair. I mean, you know, white hair come and they tell me, man, we grew up, my mother and me, we grew up to your music. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? But, you know, I've, I've yeah. started really early. I started already at 16, you know, mm -hmm. doing things. And so I don't see it like that. No, I, I, I just, be, I, can, I can only be me. Mm. And the rest is the outcome of being me. But, but that's it. I, 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 I can't be bothered really I can't be bothered with any other thing because I tell you when I moved from bass to guitar the main thing that blocked me was other people's opinions in my head right. oh but he's a bass player but he's a bass player he's a bass player and I was like you know what that's what everybody else says but inside I can decide what I am and I am now a guitar player and that was, uh, um, I know it sounds simple, but to break that barrier within my mind was yeah. a huge thing to actually go for it. It was like, but it was so freeing. And so when you free yourself from titles that other put you in, what good or bad titles, mm -hmm. you're open always to do, to create whatever you want to create because you're not, uh, you know, obligated to mm -hmm. somebody else's title. Yeah. So, you know, other people would say it about me, but I don't live like that. You know, I, I totally live like it is a day by day. <laughs> day by day, yeah. And when did you get into producing? Because, uh, I mean, you really are one of the, considered to be one of the best producers in Israel. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, that, is it Doug Nachash? Uh, yeah. You're very famous. I mean, huge band in Israel. Is that something that you wanted to do anyway right from the start yes i started producing when i was 18. um i produced the first a reggae album in israel the first israeli reggae album but then i moved to the to the u.s when i was 20. and from 20 to 30 i was just a, a bass player that got called to so many different gigs and recordings and so even um jan you played the naughty by nature in the beginning and I looked at their producer and I was like, okay, I, I saw so many different producers and I always wanted to do it because the producer is the conductor, if you will, you know, mm. of the whole thing. And I always wanted to, to, to be the, the guy that could make, you know, that stuff would go to him. And um, so 
it was it just came about that I always had lots of opinions of how <laughs> shit should be done, you know. Yeah. Right. So it's been a tough few months with this global pandemic and uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately Israel's now gone back into lockdown. Would you say that this period has affected your creativity in a positive way or a negative way, or has it been a combination of both? In a different way. I, I, you know, I, it, it doesn't have anything to do with anything that I know before. So at first I just stayed and created a lot of music and dove into like new um applications and programs in music and I listened a lot again it was great I got back to things I love and then I think once I got the uh, the offer to do the festival all of a sudden you know it just changed something in me changed and I the creativity went to a different route for a minute and I, I think that I freed myself from habits of doing one or the other. And I'm open at this point to actually, look, I'm not touring this year and I don't go on vacation because we can't go, we can't fly. So I actually go a lot on the beach every day, sometimes twice a day. I didn't do that thing for, I would fly somewhere to a beach to go to the beach. And the beach is about two kilometers from me, you know? And, and so now I'm doing it every day like that. And, um, and I don't punish myself for not creating music that day, which I, on, on a normal day, I would. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden I was like, yo, just do it. Just enjoy that. Enjoy the kids. Enjoy being at home enjoy you know whatever small things and take it day by day and uh it's very the the atmosphere could be very um depressing for some Mm. you know when all the Mm. job stops and you know you know but i um that's also a decision a lot of times whether to be depressed or to get out of it and Mm. i will tell you yesterday when they stop music in all the clubs and live shows again it was a very depressing moment for a lot of people and i i woke up like oh you know that was like it really hurts but then i was like i'm not going down this this road i'm going up and i just you know started doing other things either working out going to the beach doing things not even talking about it with people too much so i don't get down. way yeah. deeper i'm not saying that I'm, i didn't and i didn't depress other people but i did but <laughs> <laughs> but after i did i went and felt good you know so <laughs> yeah so how, how different do you think the music business is going to be from from now because i don't think I, we're ever going to go back to how it was i don't have a clue i don't, know. I don't no. have a clue i really don't i um Wow, I know music is going to be different, and that's a good thing, I think. But uh, because I think people had more time to spend on their craft, on anything, not just in music, on anything. If you do something, you're way better now than you were in February because you had time to to do your thing, you know. So I think that uh, that is going to be really, really a blessed thing in two, I think in 221, I mean, 2021 and especially 2022, we're gonna really see the difference. I feel that we are at the same point like 1970, like now we're like 69, 70, mm-hmm. where music before 69 was completely one style and from 70 was completely different. The 70s and the 60s are two different animals. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, the, this year is a turning point and music is going to be very different from now on but I don't know to which direction. I think it's going to be again deeper with way more meaning than it mm. was in the last 10 years. The last 10 years was a waste of a lot of music because it, it was just about stu- so much stupid shit that right? was unbelievable. <laughs> I don't think people are going to to get back to that, but hey, yeah. I you know, I I never would would never underestimate. 
<laughs> Brilliant. Now we're going to open up uh, to Q and A. If anybody has any questions, we are going to hear yeah. another piece of music from Yossi. Um, but if anybody has any questions, how 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 do we do this? Do I think I, hand, there like is this? one. There is one from Khulud already. Yes. Okay. From Morocco, huh? From the Gnawa power. Be careful. Oh yeah, Khulud is the first. Yeah, I, I met we, her. We've we've, uh, we've met in Gibraltar. Yeah, and I follow you on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you 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 mentioned uh, Ethiopian music, and yes. I'm a big big fan of Ethiopia in general. I've been there twice when I brought with me some Gnawa music to introduce uh, Moroccan culture to Ethiopian culture. Yeah, it was just phenomenal, and we discovered that the rhythms are it's very similar. The same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And even when we discovered some Habasha music and um, their similarities with Amazigh music uh, yeah. from the north of Africa. So my question to you, what was the impact of Ethiopian music uh, on you? Oh, it's, it's the same, uh, you know, it's the uh, something about the, the way they, the, I can't explain, but I think it's the scales that they it's use, same. you know. It's the, it's the scales. They have a very certain vibe. The way they p play their notes creates a very specific vibe. And, um, and I end up, uh, let me see. No, it's not in this room, so I can't. If I had that guitar, I have an acoustic bass guitar, okay? Which I play kind of like, uh, it's, it is the closest thing to Sintir, to uh, Gimbri. Right, so I played like a gimbri, but the way I played it reminded me of an Ethiopian instrument called bagana. Yeah, the and bagana. so I play, yeah, so I play bagana, but I play the Ganawa style. And I have a group that has uh, two Ethiopian guys. One of them is Abate Brion, who is an incredible jazz saxophone player, mm -hmm. Ethiopian, and uh, and we play. Uh, and, and, and I play more like a Genawa vibe, and he plays Ethiopian vibe, but it's so similar that it ends up being almost one thing for me. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I love the two of them, and, and, and it's, it's, there is a lot of similarities. All over Africa, the one similarity that I found in music is this. <laughs> Everywhere you go in Africa, you have this, and each country and each region dance around it you know but that's the one thing that all of africa from south africa to egypt it's that and actually it's the same it's the same thing that uh, a jazz man a certain, uh, big jazz man ethiopian jazz man said to us about music and he exchanged his uh, instrument with the gambri of uh, hamid Khusri, uh, yes. moroccan malam it was um mulatu uh, Mulato, it's, yeah, it's Mulato Asaki. Asaki. Oh, Asaki. Asaki. Yes. And, and he discovered the Moroccan music um, thanks to Hamid Khusri and he was like, I really want to go to Morocco because I feel like I have to play some Gnawa music. Yes, I, <laughs> I went to Morocco. That was my, my dream. And I went to two years ago with my family. I took my kids and we ended up being in Marrakesh and I uh, been in... Uh, with a, a Ganawa family and all day, I was like studying and studying and studying and studying and studying, you know, and I was like, wow, you know, this is so great. <laughs> it was, I love it, I loved it, you know, so yeah, I mean, Morocco is uh, one of the most inspiring places musically I've seen. It's just like, you just go in the square, uh, you know, in Marrakesh, you hear so many different styles of music coming to at you at once. Mm -hmm. uh, if you sit in one of those restaurants on top, you hear yeah. all the music at once. And uh, I love that. Thank you. We, we, want, we, we have a secret plan. Huh? You understood. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to provoke all the time. <laughs> but Khulud and uh, Nadia, for example, have a, a love story with a city in Morocco called Dakhla. Marrakesh is great, but it's for tourists. Let's put it that way today. Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Dakhla is by the Atlantic and is the starting point. Well, now you put the starting point in Ethiopia, but uh, Dakhla to go to Brazil would be a great, great story. I can see, you know, we have to write the script, basically. Ah. We're waiting for you. <laughs>
Any other questions? Yeah, well, we've got one from uh, Barack. Hey Barack. guys, there you go. Hey. Hi, Barack. What's up? A uh, question for you: If you have, a, if you have, if you find a DeLorean car parked outside your your home, and you can travel in time and go to whatever live concert you would want to, which one would you go to? Wow, what a question! <laughs> I hate you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it would probably uh, be uh, first of all. I immediately would go to the seventies. No questions asked. And uh, I would go to the 70s and it would be, uh, I can't see, Hulud, I can't see Hendrix. Hendrix. Yeah, they're, they're exactly, she's right. <laughs> so I would go to see Jimi Hendrix, A Band of Gypsies, which was in the, you know, in the New Year's Eve of 70s. That's <clears throat> probably number one. Uh, maybe Sly and the Family Stone around that time. Mm -hmm. But um, also, uh, I think Parliament Funkadelic, somewhere around 76, 77, it's the best period. I, they have live stuff in Houston, I think. Mm -hmm. And I saw Parliament Funkadelic many times, maybe 14, 50 times, 15 times throughout the years. That's the best band I've ever experienced live. Nobody comes close to them because you, it's four hours. And in those four hours, you get any style of music that you want within that. You get Hendrix vibe, you get Miles Davis vibe, you get completely, uh, you know, like art ensemble of Chicago, you get blues, you get rap, you get everything there. And it's happy, it's gospely, and it's psychedelic. And it's very freeing for the mind. So it's, it's not... Uh, I, I would definitely go there and weather report with Jacob's mm. stories for sure. <laughs> I would love to see. I've never seen them with Jacob. Interesting that you say about Funkadelic because George Clinton was here, I think it was last year at the Love Supreme Festival or the mm -hmm. year before, and he still got it. I mean, he's incredible on stage. Unbelievable. And the, the, whole, the, band. Band, and the whole band. And, and it's just like when I saw them, uh, it was like the closest thing to see Hendrix mm. to me. And it wasn't that the Hendrix, the, the virtue also, it was just the vibe, the vibe that yeah. came out of the stage. I was like, oh, that's the closest thing to a band of gypsies. You know, it's just like, it was amazing. But my show with uh, Ben Elon is based on a Funkadelic show. And mm. I studied their show, the way they start the show, the way, you know, how it evolves and the whole thing, that's how I tell the story. It's through a funkadelic thing. And it's the extension of black music that came out of Africa. It's a tribe that has this ancient knowledge about music and they bring it to you uh, in a different way, in a fun way. So Barack, does that answer your question? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I have another point, but it's not a question. Next year, if you have the same car, where would you go? You see to Gibraltar, hopefully, and that <laughs> we will all meet there <laughs> and maybe take the trip for tomorrow. Or just after that, that would be the dream. If there is any other question, please, uh, it's now. Otherwise, we wanted to to play maybe uh, the last uh, beat. It's called Doner Kebab, actually. <laughs> <laughs> organ, using, organ donor kebab. Organ, organ, donor. organ obviously. Yes. If the yeah. sound is not great, as you know, we'll edit after that. So I apologize in advance. And I will take the opportunity to say thank you to everyone, obviously. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Yosifine, for taking the time with us. We are so pleased. I want to make you feel that it's just not finished. That's why I'll cut it that way. So that we are obliged and we have the will to come back and to see each other again here or there. It doesn't really matter. Look. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hulud, Ruth, Barak, Jose. Daphne, I didn't get to talk to you, but, but everybody, thank you. It's great to see you. And I hope to see you sooner yes. than, you know, uh, three years. So let's go for the last bit. All right.
uh, again, thank you so much for all of you. Remember, you see, it's called Kushame, which is a local uh, dialect uh, word, which means... What does it mean? It comes from Escuchame in Spanish, mm -hmm. which means listen to me. And for this type of conversation, I think it's quite uh, adapted. And the scoop is obviously that this is the theme of the next festival in Gibraltar. Yes, and I, let's just say that we hope to have seen each other in the next festivals, you know, as soon as possible, as soon as possible. And, um, you know, that's the main thing, to bring back music to live stages. Yeah. One thing I would have to say about whatever music is going to be, it's if people not going to get the live experience of being, you know, live, of experiencing this thing between the artist and the audience and the audience within themselves, something in humanity is going to go to waste because that's something that we all need to get together yeah. and dance together in music. And music brings more people and more cultures other than airplanes uh, <laughs> together, you know? It's yeah, just, true. it's just, I know people from all around the world because of music. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you again, and uh, see you next time, very yes. soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.